We're going to go ahead and get started. We have plenty to accomplish today, and I'm really looking forward to this session. By the way, we are recording the session. We'll make a copy, uh, a link to the recording available to everyone, as well as a copy of the slides. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Daryl Burrell, uh, finding your scholarly voice using peer-reviewed publications to showcase your expertise. And here's the agenda that we'll be following. I'll spend just a few moments talking about capital. I recognize that many people are very familiar with it, but there may be a few in the audience that are not. Uh, talk about housekeeping session pointers, introduce the presenter. Uh, you'll hear from the presentation, which of course is the bulk of the program today. Uh, we'll allow a little bit of time near the end of the presentation for Q&A and uh, then I'll talk about upcoming webinars in the series and how to get a copy of the recording slides and a certif certificate of attendance or participation. Again, uh, many of you, I look at the list of people that are attending today and I recognize some of you are extraordinarily uh, involved with capital. So this is uh, uh, not new information to you, but for the few that might, uh, we were established in 1927, which means in just three years, we will be celebrating our 100th anniversary. We're one of the few universities located in the state of Maryland and indeed in the entire country that is specifically uh, focused and dedicated to STEM, uh, particularly uh, any program that has to do with high technology. Uh, we offer accredited degrees from the associate, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral level. And our speaker today, as you'll learn when you see his bio, has two of those degrees from us. Uh, we're nonprofit, private, and accredited. I could take a lot of time to unpack all of those, but let me just simply say that the, probably the big one is the accredited. Um, across the United States, there are 4,500 universities and colleges, and the way you know whether they're an, a credible, uh, authorized university is their accreditation, and we have that, the regional accreditation from the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. We also are authorized by the state of Maryland. We're located in Laurel, Maryland, uh, to confer all of the degrees that we offer all the way from the associate right up to all of our various doctoral degrees. Here is some housekeeping that we want to do here. We're going to answer questions at the conclusion of the presentation, and we will do that via text chat. I mean, the question will be answered verbally, but if you'll type in your question, in the text chat, we'll be monitoring that and circle back to them. So you can ask them at any time and we'll take most of the questions right at the end of the presentation. We're not activating microphones and webcams for the participants today. So the way that we need you to communicate with us is via the text chat. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna send a link to the recording and to the slides to everyone who's registered for the session today. It'll also be available on our YouTube channel and on our webinar webpage. And finally, and I'll talk about this more at the end, we offer a participation certificate from the university for one hour of uh, uh, continuing education credit, and that's available by request. And I'll talk more about that in a uh, little bit. Well, let me get, uh, get right into it. I wanted to introduce our pres uh, presenter, Dr. Daryl N. Burrell. Uh, he's a visiting scholar at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice. And that's a long title for that name of that institute uh, at Rutgers University. He's a visiting researcher at Pellegrino Center for uh, Clinical Bioethics at Georgetown University Medical Center, a postdoc public health researcher at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. He has 20 years plus experience in management, teaching, and training. And uh, this is what he's going to be talking about today. He has published over 180 peer-reviewed publications and has 900 Google Scholar citations. And uh, he has three earned doctorates. And uh, forgive me for uh, joking at your expense, Dr. Burrell, but I was just thinking, remember that old show, The Brady Bunch, where they always talked about Marsha, Marsha, Marsha? But yeah. here we could talk about doctor, 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 because you have three earned doctorates, uh, one from A.T. Still University and two from Capital uh, in widely divergent areas. And you'll see that when he talks about his research, that it actually covers a lot of different fields because of uh, his far reaching interests. Well, with that, I'm going to turn control over to uh, Dr. Burrell. Uh, forgive us as we boggle around just a little bit uh, to make sure that um, uh, he has uh, screen sharing um, ability. So 
Uh, bear with me while I do that. All right, let's see if you, there we go. All right, and I'm going to stop my slide deck and uh, let him take it away. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. It's always good when you can graduate from a school and then go back and contribute to an organization or institution that's done so much to help me. One of the things I wanna to point to in this presentation is a little bit about my background. Um, and why I care about this topic. So I'm probably one of the most unlikely people you'll meet with three doctorates. And I struggled and flunked out of undergrad three times before I got my bachelor's degree. I did not get my bachelor's degree till I was 30. And I met a professor that made me fall in love with learning. And I became a lifelong learner. My doctoral experience was difficult. It took me three programs in 10 years to get my doctorate. And part of the reason why I care is you know, if you're a full time worker with real world experience and you're trying to pursue a doctorate, you know, it's a jungle out there. It's a challenge. You know, I always explain to people that a lot of times pursuing a doctorate is like an episode of the Nat Geo show Naked and Afraid. Where you get dropped in the wilderness with no clothes and no food. And they're like, if you can make it to the extraction point, you can get out. And so as an educator, as a scholar, as a researcher, I try to be the person that I wish I would have had in my first doctorate that gave me the insight that wouldn't have took me 10 years to finish. And that's the reason why I care about this topic. I also care about this topic because those of us that are non-traditional learners wanna sometimes navigate spaces at institutions or at research organizations. And a lot of times we're trying to knock on the door and we can't get in and we don't understand why because we don't understand what they're looking for. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about career planning. We're gonna talk about publishing, what it means to be a thought leader. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a doctorate as a passport and a doctorate as a master key. One of the things I explain to people is, if you're just getting a doctorate and hanging on the wall and you're not engaging in any research or scholarship, then you're really limiting what you can do with a doctorate. My doctorate has been a passport for me. It's taking me places to teach that I never thought I would or places that people told me that I couldn't go. And because I was able to combine my doctorate with scholarship, doors open to me. I've taught for University of Liverpool in the UK, University of Virginia, George Mason, University of North Carolina, Chapel, Chapel Hill. I also say a doctor is a master key because if you leverage it right, and that's why the scholarship is important, my doctorate opened doors for me that I didn't even know existed. And so let's explain a little bit in more detail. So there's this concept in academia called publisher parish. What does that mean? So true story. Um, I have a colleague who went to a university who was all excited. They were on tenure track and they were just there and teaching and they were just all excited about teaching and they present at a couple of conferences. So when you go to a university, usually some universities have a three year, five year or seven year uh, path to tenure. So if you don't know what tenure is, you're hired as a faculty member and then they evaluate you based on your research, service, and scholarship. And then you put together a portfolio and they say yes or no for tenure. So this particular friend was teaching and having a great time. It was a five-year program. And then at year three, they had a tenure review meeting. And the teacher had great evaluations, had great uh, uh, service, was on a lot of committees. But when it came to publishing, they didn't have anything. And so at this particular institution, they had a kind of a threshold of how many things that you needed to publish by that time frame. And the pre-tenure meeting put her, put her on probation for another year to get her tenure together. And then at year four, they told her, it's obvious you're not gonna make tenure because you don't have the publications required to make tenure. So just realize at the end of your fifth year, you know, we're gonna wave by and we suggest you find another place to go. Now, this is a harsh reality that a lot of people don't know about, but this happens in a lot of institutions. If you don't have that peer review scholarship, you know, it limits the ability of what you, you can do. The other thing I want to explain is what's happening with the value of a doctorate. In the last five years, doctorate programs have exploded everywhere. So 10 years ago, you could get an online teaching job with a master's. It's very difficult to get that today. 
Also, what's happening is universes are changing for financial reasons. You know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 80% of the courses were taught by full-time faculty members. 20% are adjunct. A lot of schools that is flipped. So 20% of full-time faculty are teaching, 80% are adjunct. So as a result, schools are putting pressure to make sure their adjuncts have a doctorate. And then the accreditation bodies are putting pressure to make sure that their adjuncts are what they call scholarly academics, have scholarship. The other thing that's important to understand is top universities like a private country club. Now, what do I mean by that? What that means is country club members let in people that look like them. So even though you might be pursuing a doctorate non-traditionally, if you want to teach at the top schools at your state you or in your area, on paper, you have to look like they do, meaning you have to have the scholarship, the publications, the, the, the other activities that they have in order to be competitive for these jobs. So what this does is this creates kind of a perfect storm or like a crazy landscape that really can overwhelm you if you're just saying, oh, I just came in to get a doctorate. I thought, I thought that's all I needed to do. I've had colleagues come to me and say, well, you know, a lot, a lot of people have a doctorate in my particular field and they have this feeling that people are gonna ring their door like publishers clearing house with a $10 million check and hire them and that's just not true. So we talked about that. The other thing let's talk about is the intense competition for academic jobs. So because there are so many programs out here to get a doctorate, now there's intense competition to, to get these jobs. So when you're seeing these academic jobs, they might only hire one person. But I know from being at a university full time, you know, for one academic job, we could get, you know, 100 to 300 CVs. And so with all things being equal, if you have a doctorate, and the other person has a doctorate, but they have 10 publications, you know, who is the university gonna lean, for, lean at? The other thing in academia is what I call status and stratus. So status is, do you have a doctorate? And then second conversation is where is it from, right? Or what is it in? And then the stratus area is, do you have peer review, scholarship and publications, right? We talked about more schools using adjunct faculty to teach, and that's important. So let's talk about some myths. So there's some people that might be on this webinar saying, oh, I just need to get my doctor, it'll be fine, right? Or I don't need to publish to teach online. That's a huge myth. Now I've taught online for some schools. They have an annual scholarly requirement where if you're not engaged in something scholarly on an annual basis, then they'll limit your ability to teach. Um, I don't need to publish to get consulting jobs. You really do, because what a publication does, if someone is considering you as a consultant, is a publication can be an artifact that really shows your expertise. Because when you publish an article, it's been peer reviewed, meaning two or three PhDs have looked at it and said it's good, put it out there, it adds a level of credibility. Some of you are consultants where you have your own website. You know, it's important to have content on that website. Now, there's a lot of people putting blogs and white pages, but it's more powerful to show that you have peer review articles on there. I don't need to publish because I work in industry. I will also challenge you on that too, because even if you work in industry, if you're applying for that senior level job and you're applying against someone that all your credentials are equal, and even though that job is in industry, if you can show the applicant pool, and also I published two articles in this and I presented at two conferences in that, then guess what? That's something that separate you. Uh, you can't make money teaching. That's a misnomer. So one of the things that I'll challenge you all is to challenge me. When we get done with this call, or maybe if you have time now, go and look at some of the top universities in your state that are public. One of the ones I tell people to go do that's real easy is look at uh, salaries for faculty at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and you can easily see. And what you'll see from that is you know, the average faculty member, I think, in the School of Business makes 180000 U.S. dollars a year. In the School of Public Health, it's somewhere 120000 130000 
But in order to get to these top schools, you have to have the scholarship. They're not going to hire you at top schools. Now, I meet a lot of colleagues that say, oh, my friend's doing well. They're teaching at this school that's on TV and, and that school that advertises a lot. But let me explain to you, even as an adjunct, if you have the scholarship versus someone that don't doesn't, you're looking at someone that might make two or three thousand dollars to teach at, let's say, Southern New Hampshire versus teaching at Arizona State where you can make seven to ten thousand dollars to teach the same course. And the difference is you have a doctorate, but you have scholarship along with it that makes those more prominent institutions. Right. Hire you. So it's important. You know, I, I heard people say, oh, my friend teaches online for many schools without any publications. The challenge is, are they teaching at the top schools that pay the highest amount of money? Because realize you're doing the work anyway to teach the class. So when you rather make, you know, seven or $10,000 than making two or $3,000. So one of the other ones, especially you all are in STEM or cyber is, oh, I got certification, so I'm good. Your certifications matter in industry, but at a lot of top universities, a lot of them don't care about your certifications because if you look at the faculty that teach cybersecurity at those schools, they don't have the certifications, but they do have publications. The other one I see a lot on LinkedIn is I self-publish my books. People say publish author, motivational speaker, right? Life coach. A self-published book at most institutions, does that matter to help you get hired? Or a lot of times universities won't even count it towards tenure because a self-published book hasn't gone through a peer review process where individual reviewers have looked at it and said, hey, this is good work. Published blogs on LinkedIn. Uh, so that's solid academic publishing. No, it's not. So yes, motivational speaking will get you known you know, we'll get you recognized. But again, if you're trying to go in that academic space or if you're trying to go in that high level consulting space, research really, really matters. And one of the things that I'll share with you is that a lot of people are not exposed to is a lot of institutions don't just have faculty teaching jobs. They have faculty research positions. And these are jobs where you apply for grants do research and publish around your research. A classic example is um, I have a colleague that interviewed with Stanford at the School of Medicine and the, the top salary for that position was $205,000 a year. The only reason why he got that interview was because he had the scholarship along with the doctorate. Those top schools are not gonna hire you as a research professor if you have no publications, which means no research. So one of the things is I talk about this concept called role modeling to challenge what I'm saying. And what I call role modeling is if you live at certain places in the country around the world, and if you know that the top university, pick a top university by you, and then look in the department where the faculty are. A lot of times they have faculty bios, but a lot of times they have academic CVs or resumes there. What's important is to look at their resumes and CVs and see what it is that they have so that you can try to go out and emulate it. I tell people this, this process I call role modeling, where you look at these people and see what they have and, 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 and Google it and do research is an important part of your career and professional development. You know, one of the challenges, and we all have colleagues and friends that are getting their doctors for for-profit universities, and one of the challenges is we have a level of snobbery in the United States at the top institutions where many of them will not hire graduates from those for-profit universities. And even though they're accredited, it's a conversation a lot of people don't want to share. You know, we all have colleagues and friends that went there. I have many of them that went there, got frustrated, came back to Capitol and got a second degree. But those that have that I've seen that have been able to break through, maybe not at the top research institutions, but maybe at a teaching school at their state, seem to be those that have gone out and published 10, 15, 20 articles to show 
that they just weren't getting a doctor to check the box, but they went out and did the research along with it. Part of the reason why it's important for you to also look at, you know, the, the CVs and resumes of other people is to really gauge where you need to go. So for me, when I target a university, especially when I finished my second doctorate in 2021, and, and I'll share this with you, one of the reasons why I went back to get a PhD when I had an applied doctorate was I just saw when I started to look at universities that the large research universities that paid the most money really favored people with a PhD over an applied doctorate. We all know people that have DBAs, DPAs, EDDs, but I just saw that they tend to favor that. And then I also looked at the faculty that they had hired in the last five years or less to see, okay, what kind of associations were they on? What kind of conferences are they presenting at? How many publications that they had? And a lot of times you'll see if they have four or five, six, seven, ten, you know, in order to be competitive, you've got to get on your bike and start riding and pedal to catch up with them. And the reason why it's important to look at what they have and emulate them is a lot of times they'll be on the search committee deciding, right, whether you get hired or not. And that's the whole premise of what I said before, country club members letting people that look like them. If you look like them on paper, you're more apt to be admitted. So the other thing that's lesser known is I ask people is, especially doctoral students, are you presenting at conferences? And peer review conferences matter. A lot of you in the tech world present at industry conferences, they're okay. But universities really want you at peer review academic conferences to present. For the you that are doctoral students, I say if you're in and you know, you're in this program for two years, you should be presenting your research a minimum three times while you're a student. I know when I was a doctoral student, the first time I presented my stuff for, at four conferences and I presented my research as a work in progress. And why is that important? It's important because you get feedback from other researchers about your approach. It's also important because people will tell you about theories or concepts that you may not be familiar with. It's also important because it builds your confidence in talking about your research. Because when you get to the defense, you're gonna have to explain it, defend it. I was a lot more comfortable doing it because I had already presented my concept four times at academic conferences. So I'm a big advocate of, yes, publications are the pinnacle, but you should also be presenting at peer review conferences. And by the way, a lot of these conferences give discounts if you're a student. And what I tell a lot of my doc students to do is, email the conference organizer and ask them if they accept students as volunteers, which a lot of them do to help with logistics. And then a lot of times they'll waive your registration fee. And then what I will do then is if my registration fees waive, then maybe I'll find a colleague and say, let's travel together, let's drive, you know, to cut down on expense. And then if I know that my fee is waived, I'm not going to send one presentation at a conference. I might send two or three. And then that way at a conference, you you get three peer review publications that, I mean, three, three peer review presentations that you could put on your resume. But some of the best conferences also publish papers in a conference proceedings, which is indexed in Google Scholar and Scopus, which also counts as a publication. I like conferences, even though they have fees to register, because usually one month after that conference, you know your paper is going to be out versus if you send to a journal, that review process can take a certain amount of time. If that journal only publishes one time a year and you miss that window, then guess what? Your paper might not publish till this time next year. So career goals, I'm a big advocate of uh, career goals. And again, challenging yourself, what have you done as peer review? So a lot of times when I've taught in classes face-to-face, -face, I ask my students, what is your Google factor? So when people type your name in Google, what comes up? And I always tease them and say, 
hopefully not open police warrants, right? But one of the things that's important now is when you're being asked to be a speaker or when you're being considered as a consultant or when you're being considered as a faculty member, Members on the search committee are going to type your name in Google and see, do you have scholarship and research out there? And if you have nothing, right, <laughs> that's a problem. And so one of the things that you do is when you start to publish, you know, you create a Google Scholar profile. And then in your Google Scholar profile, your publications download. And what's cool about your Google Scholar profile is it tracks the people that cite you. And where that's important is if someone says, well, I never heard of that journal, you can always go back and challenge them and say, well, maybe you never heard of it, but other people have. Look at the citations I have publishing in that journal. And so one of the things that you want to do is you want to create and build your brand as a researcher out there based on the things you're publishing, which come up and the abstracts from conferences and your Google Scholar profile. So we talk about what is publishing. You're taking an idea and you're sending it to someone and you're trying to reach an audience, right? But what's cool about it is it stays out there indefinitely. I try not to be morbid, right? But I always tell scholars that if God forbid something happened to you tomorrow, what's your legacy out there in the universe, right? Will people still be talking about you and the impact you made? Well, your research lives forever. You know, one of the most powerful things with my kids is I was able to show them, look at what your dad published in this journal. And interesting enough, you know, it created a legacy out there. One of the interesting things for me when I was a doc student was I published a paper on critical thinking skills. And where I started was taking papers from my master's class programs. And I was a doctoral student, brushing them up and sending them to journals. Now, at first, I never had a webinar or someone that would teach me the game. So it took me a year doing all the wrong things. So I really learned the process. I was sending papers that were lit reviews to journals that only wanted statistical based research. I was getting things rejected and I was just getting frustrated because I just didn't know the process. And then eventually I ended up getting a paper published where I took a class in innovation and critical thinking skills. And I basically talked about here we were trying to protect ourselves in the Homeland security phase. And we were thinking it was going to be a, a, a dirty bomb or, you know, some kind of other cyber attack. And here we were attacked in nine 11 by people with box cutters and commercial airlines. And so what I got out of that is what we needed was critical thinking skills in Homeland Security. And so I went out there and I thought about that concept and I put 9-11 as a framework. And then I went out and researched theories on critical thinking to put in a lit review. And then, you know, I reached out and found research on what's the best way to develop leaders with critical thinking skills. And at the end, those were my recommendations. And I sent it to International Journal of Homeland Security and it got published. And so what ended up happening after that was after it got published, when your article gets published, there's an email on how to reach you and contact you. And someone emailed me from a Harvard email and said, I just read your paper. I'm citing you in my dissertation. This is exactly something I need in my lit review. And that was the ultimate <laughs> flattering compliment to me because I never went to Harvard. But the fact that someone from Harvard who had a master's from Princeton was citing me in her dissertation was, was validation and confirmation for me. And then once I had a good literature review together around critical thinking skills, I really said to myself, well, police officers need critical thinking skills too. Nurses need critical thinking skills. And so I started carving out a series of articles taking some of the same approaches, but applying it to different industries and sending it to journals in that industry. Now, a lot of journals have particular things about, you know, you recycling a, an article and sending it somewhere else. 
which that is considered unethical in the publishing game, but there's similar concepts that you can use. So once you develop a line of literature and research, you know, you can build that in, in a long way. And one of the things I try to explain to people is you have to think strategically. Like what most people will do is because they're cybersecurity, they're going to go in the International Journal of Cybersecurity. Well, what I will tell you is if you're writing a paper on insider threat, they might get 10 of those papers a month. But the Journal of Healthcare Management might not. So if you're taking that insider threat and putting it in healthcare management journal, then you might have a higher propensity of getting it accepted. Or the Journal of Higher Education Management, you know, would be different. So our normal thing is if we're doing something in management, we want to go to a management journal. But a lot of times I've had success putting it in journals in different fields because they don't get a lot of papers related to that. So why don't you publish? So the biggest reasons why people don't publish is they don't know where to start, don't understand why it matters, don't know the process, feel unworthy, feel fear, right? Thinking it has to be the cure of cancer. It does not. I just gave a cr example on critical thinking skills that went out there. Um, I wrote an article about that got published a little while ago where some of you are doing consulting in organizations or some of you are working on projects at work that you could potentially publish. So I was born in as a consultant for a winery during COVID that made all their money by doing tours in the winery. Guess what? They're shut down. They can't do it. So one of the things that they ended up doing was having wine tasting doing Zoom. So in advance of the Zoom, they would ship the wine to the people and everyone would log in on Zoom and they'd have discussions around it. And they started building this followership where they had these things on wine and cooking through Zoom. And that's how they promoted their winery and sold their wine through Zoom. Well, I took their name off of it, changed the name around it, put some theories around complexity and adaptability leadership and turn that into a case study that I got published. Some of you all every day are working in organizations where you're creating new programs and you're fixing problems and you're fixing things. If you can go out there and get the theories from the literature and get the models and the frameworks, these things can become things that are publishable. So you, again, you don't have to find a cure of cancer to get something that you'll publish, that will be publishable. I tell people start with graduate papers or doctorate papers. It's the easiest place to start because you've already done a lot of the heavy lifting. Just upgrade it, add content. Obviously, you're a doctoral student or you completed your doctorate. You're a better writer now, but that's a place where you can start. So really what you're doing when you're publishing is you're an academic conversation. You're establishing a territory where you're showing importance you're creating a niche where you're indicating a gap that you're filling, right? And then you're just really uh, jumping into that niche and telling your own story in your own way. So what's in it for me, right? Your work in print establishes you as a thought leader. You get to share your ideas and develop your career. You prove your success. You demonstrate your knowledge, right? You gain recognition, and it makes you competitive for faculty jobs when you're publishing. I also challenge Dr. Brill, to get to doctor. I, I need to interrupt yeah. for a second. I'm getting reports that not everybody has seen the slides, uh, that, that it's stuck on the first slide. And so if everyone will bear with me, I will... Um, switch over to my master deck, which should be able to handle that. And we'll see what's going on. So uh, bear with me as we do that. It's an unusual problem that I've not experienced before. So um, let me um, uh, stop this for a second. And then, um, okay. Now, let me ask everybody uh, if you can see the slide that says finding your scholarly voice in a blue slide. Yes. Okay. In that case, now I need to advance to uh, where 
uh, Dr. Burrell was, which is quite a ways into the presentation. So um, you're getting, if you could speed read, you could read these right now. I will send the slides to everybody. Uh, so don't worry about that. But I know that it would be good for you to be able. Uh, Dr. Burrell, tell me when we're back to where you need to be. And then Keep going. You, you can just tell me when to advance the slides and I will go ahead and do that. It's a little cumbersome, but it'll make yeah, sure that fine. everybody can see them. That's fine. Next slide. Okay, so go back. Go back to. Go back to. Go back to. Okay, Next it's, one, pausing. Back. it's pausing on me. I went too quickly. Okay, let's try it again. Okay. There we go. Is this where we are? Yes. So okay. I always tell people, you know, it's your responsibility and duty in your community and profession to not just get a doctorate and do nothing with it, right? The reality is maybe 10 people in the world will ever read your dissertation, but a lot of people will look at your publication and we'll cite your work. Some of us come from families and communities where we're the first generation to go to college and graduate college. And we know that there's significant problems in our communities that we care about. And it could be the motivation as to why we did our research or did our doctorate. So it's important for us to try to solve those problems by publishing and having conversations on them. I've been the person where I stepped in rooms and I presented at conferences where I've been the only person at the conference that looks like me or has this story to tell. But what if I just decided, oh, I have a doctorate, there's no other need. So I always tell people you have a responsibility and a duty to not just get your doctorate, but to really go out there and use your voice and try to use your scholarship to solve real world problems. The other thing I tell people is you can make $100,000 teaching online with the right schools. I have a colleague, that's what she wants to do. She adjuncts with a whole bunch of schools, but she adjuncts with top schools. And she literally sits at home, teaches from home and makes $100,000 teaching online. So if that's something that motivates you, if you say, hey, I'm tired of working for someone else. You know, we have a lot of people on LinkedIn, other people that talk about entrepreneurship. I always say getting a doctorate and having scholarship and working with schools you can be the ultimate entrepreneur where you can be a hired gun and go to many schools and teach online and literally make over $100,000. Next slide, please. How do we, how do you get started, right? Have you completed a project successfully, right? Is there a problem out there with no solution or do you have opinion on a subject? Or have you given a presentation or briefing or conference paper? Or are you working on a master's or doctoral prob project? These are all things that could be publishable papers. Next slide. So one way you can get started is obviously you can publish by yourself, but you could co-author. A lot of you all that are doctoral students, you can publish with your chair. It's common at Capitol where you're the first author, your chair is your second because your chair is mentoring you and giving you feedback to co-publish with them. But I publish a lot with classmates. I publish a lot with my doctoral students where I might have an old paper. I'm very, very busy. I'll write three pages. You write three pages and we'll put it all together into one paper. That way you don't have to do the heavy lifting on your own. If you know you need to write 15 pages to do a journal article and you're working, you're in class, it's easy for you to, get you know three people to write five pages each um one of the things that's good with publishing with other people is it allows you to build together the strengths of a variety of you all at one time like you know if you have someone who's really good at stats maybe they can bring a statistical aspect of it or if you have someone that's maybe a, a good sociology person and you're writing something about cybersecurity and there's some themes from models from sociology or theories from sociology or social psychology, they can bring them in there to help enhance your article. But the key thing is you have to be unselfish and not get into petty fights. One of the reasons why I publish a lot is I publish with colleagues and we don't fight over who's the first author, who's the second, who's the third, right? I have papers out there that might be me and nine students, me and seven students. I tell them, it still goes on your CV. When people cite you on Google, you still get on there. So 
to me, I try to share the love and share the wealth with other people. So as friends or colleagues, you just decide, hey, this time I'll be first. Next time you'll be first. Next time together you'll do it. Or we do things where we go to conferences together. So if there's three of us and we want to go to a conference and the conference publishes papers in the proceedings, which is a publication, we include each other on each other's presentations and on each other's conference presentation. So if each one of us do two papers each at the conference, and also we do two presentations on that paper, and we put each other on each person's paper, then guess what? You get six publications by attending one conference if each one of the three of you, two papers get accepted. And that's how you collaborate and you can grow your scholarship pretty quickly. Next slide. So what type of manuscript? Obviously there's four articles, there's review papers. So a lot of times people think you have to collect data to publish a paper. No, there's journals that if you write, if you have a research problem and you go out in the literature and find recommendations from other articles on how to solve the problem, you can do that. And then I also mentioned case studies. Next slide. You know, as I said, every project you've worked on, you know, every problem you solve where you work is publishable. Just if you work in your organization, just change the name, come up with a pseudo name, and you stay in the article, this name is changed to collect to protect the intellectual property and privacy of this organization and state what the problem is in the introduction, you know, create a problem statement that talks about the significance, go in and find some theories from the literature that explain what's happening and then find solutions. So a classic example of something I've done was I went into an organization that had a whole bunch of sexual harassment complaints, small contracting company, the senior leaders were all removed. You know, the series of women in management filed this complaint. They had checked the box, uh, what I call click-through training on sexual harassment, right? And then it just wasn't effective. And so I went in and made some recommendations on what they needed to do to change the culture. Well, I turned that into an article by going out explaining the dynamic sexual harassment. I went out and found some statistics about the impact of sexual harassment. And then I started to think about, okay, an organization where sexual harassment is rampant, what is going on? Obviously, how does it affect the organization? How does it affect the employees? How does it affect the culture? How does it affect the morale? And I found articles and theories that spoke to that and put that in my article. Then at the end, I went out in the literature and talked about the recommendations I made, and I made five or 10 recommendations at the end, right? And so when they asked the method of that, you know, it was intervention research or action research was my method, because this is actually, I went in an organization and did it. But if I would have never went in the organization, I could say my method was literature review, where I went out there and found different people that had talked about this topic in a dispersed discussion, and then I combined it all in a unified discussion, and that was my article. Next slide. So the writing style in these articles is this. You almost have to, it has to look a certain way. You almost have to have a reference per every sentence or every other sentence. So if you're writing paragraphs with no references, they're gonna reject it because it sounds like your opinion. Now, you might have some widely accepted opinions, but you need to have a reference <laughs> that supports your opinion. You need to write with the meal writing approach. For those of you who are, are not familiar, remember this. Meal, M-E-A-L, there's videos on YouTube. If you're a new doctoral student or if you're new to academic publishing, you're going to have to learn this to get through your program. It's a way of academic writing that's really required. And it's a way to put together your paragraphs in a way that will allow you to write in a level that you can get these papers accepted. I fully endorse the use of Grammarly Premium. Anyone that's a doctoral student or 
that's a professor that doesn't use Grammarly Premium, shame on you. You know, I have some learning disabilities when it comes to reading and writing, and Grammarly allows me to catch those things. And so I talk about that. Most academic articles are 4,000 to 6, I mean, 4,000 to 6,000 words, which is 16 to 24 pages, double space. But if you're doing a proceeding at a conference, it could be, you know, four pages, single space to six pages, single space. So you're talking about eight page paper to a 12 page paper, a lot shorter, more concise um, in terms of them and publishing. Next slide, please. So a complete paper will have the following, a title, an abstract, your keywords. Your keywords are what people will search when they find your article. So a lot of times people say, well, I'm cybersecurity. I need to be in the Journal of Cybersecurity. Well, as long as you have the keywords, you could be in the Journal of Basket Weaving. But if your keyword says cybersecurity in it, people will find it. A lot of times when we search for articles, we search for keywords. We don't search for journals. You have to do an introduction, one or two pages. You have to do a problem statement. This is where a lot of people fail. Your problem statement has to show evidence from research that a problem exists. A lot of times people work in a field and they're like, this is a problem. I know it's a problem. I see it every day. That's fine. But you better go out there to some association or organization that shows you the problem. So if you're writing on cybercrime, you can't just write a problem that says cybercrime is there. You need to go out there and find an article that has a number that says cybercrime costs this $6 billion. Or if you're talking about there's workforce shortages in cyber, go out there and find an article with a reference that shows a shortage. You got to have a significance of the paper, methodology, what methodology you're going to use, theories from the literature and a lit review. So you're going to have two or three theories that explain the dynamic in a lit review is you're going to go out and talk about how other researchers have talked about your specific problem on your topic. You will have results and recommendations. And then I always say recommendation for future research where you recommend that other people research this or research that because obviously you can't do it all in your paper. Next slide. Next slide. So your introduction just basically describes what's happening, introduces people. It's not... You should not go in an article just stating what it's about. You really need to go out there and find some research statistics and trends that explain to people why they should care. Next slide. Your problem statement, five to, sentence, five to seven sentences long, um, that basically you need to provide a statistics from the last five years that shows evidence a problem exists. Next slide. Next slide, we can skip that. So here's an example of a problem statement. Cybersecurity crime forecasts indicate the need for more information security professionals. I support that with a reference, not my opinion. The demand for more cybersecurity professionals expect to rise 6 million globally by 2025 with a protected shortfall of 1.5 million. Again, there is my statistic that shows evidence of the problem. Then I write the general problem is organizations need more workers with cybersecurity skills to meet the challenge. The specific problem is understanding the best practices for recruiting and developing cybersecurity talent. And I wanna focus on Asian American women. So I might say developing Asian American women talent. There is limited research that looks at this problem from a perspective of Asian American women. That's a problem statement right there. For those of you all that are capital students doing an exergesis, my students need to write a problem statement like that in their ARB of their capitals, capital studies if they're a student at capital. Next slide. Purpose statement, again, you're showing the purpose of this study. And in the purpose statement, you need to show what your methodology is and who you're going to help. Next slide. Yeah, we're going to share the slides with everyone. Your methods. So one is a research article. Next slide. 
One could be a community intervention as your method. Next slide. Management consultant intervention could be your method. Next slide. Literature review. Next slide. Technical note for them of you all that are technical people in a cyber STEM field. Next slide. Perspective, where you're recommending that we do this about policy. So those of you all that are AI folks, we know that the policy is not up to speed with the technology. So this is a, a perspective paper, could be a paper that you could write that show we need to have policy on this or that. Next slide. Significance of the study, two to three paragraphs that basically show why this is important or why you know your paper is significant. You should have that section there. Next slide. We talked about theories from the literature, and then you've got to not just list a theory, but explain how the theory fits. So one theory we all know is technology acceptance model. Don't just do the theory and write it but talk about the theory of maybe your topic is why are people adopting this new technology? Next slide. So I try to give common theories. And if you're not familiar with these, right, you're not gonna use ChatGPT to write your paper, but you use ChatGPT to help you with research where you're saying, hey, what are some technology theories that apply to cybersecurity? Or what are some change management theories that apply to changing organizational culture that relate to cybersecurity where employees are not cyber aware? Or what are some leadership theories that relate to cybersecurity? That's where you use ChatGPT to help you find the theories. And then once you find the theories, then you go to Google Scholar or the library, and now you read articles so you learn about the theories and you can take the theories and apply them in your paper. Next slide. In your literature review section, you need to talk about what previous researchers have said about your problem or your topic, and you need to talk about the challenges around your topic. So a lot of literature review, people don't know what to do. That's where you're going back and you're not listing a bunch of terms. You're talking about how other researchers have described this problem and the complexities of your problem and your topic. Next slide. And then in the conclusion, five or 10 most important takeaways from the article, right? And five or 10 actionable recommendations at the end. Next slide. Future recommendations show how future studies can build or recommend they do a different method. I did a lit review. I recommend someone do qualitative interviews, et cetera. Next slide. So select the best journal. Here's the questions, because I've been on defenses, and I'm sorry I'm running a little bit behind. Hopefully, we can stay a little bit if that's okay. So. I was on uh, defense as an external examiner and I've had students come to me and they've said, well, I've got this journal, what do you think? So the first thing is, is the journal peer reviewed? Who is the audience of the journal? What's the average time to print is the journal index, right? Does the journal charge an APC charge? I learned this the hard way. I had a journal approach me, send me an email, we'd like a paper from you. I sent them a paper. It wasn't seven days, the paper was accepted and they sent me an invoice for $1,200. Why? Because they were considered a predatory journal. There are certain journals that have APC charges or article processing charges. So when you look at a journal, if you're unsure, you want to look at the author guidelines and figure out, do they have a charge or not, or email the author, because there's some journals that have processing charges. Now, is the journal on the Beals list? Beals is a list of predatory journals. They call predatory journals are journals that charge these crazy processing charges. Many of them are not peer reviewed. Many of them are not indexed at the places they say they are. 
Many of them have editorial boards with faculty members that either don't exist or they've just put someone's name on there. And their whole premise is to get people to send them papers and make money. So Beal's list of predatory journals has a lot of journals on there. Now, there are some reputable journals that charge an APC charges, charge, but I always tell people a reasonable charge is something like 100 euros or less or $100 or less. But I will share with you some journals in a minute that have no APC charges whatsoever. And they're also open, openly indexed. And a lot of journals charge APC charges because you don't have to subscribe to the journal. They have full text online. But I'll share some journals that have that if you publish, people can get it through Google and they don't have to subscribe and you don't have to pay a crazy APC charge. Next slide. So these are my list of journals. So there's a journal called Land Forces Academy Review. If any of you all have your phone, this is a slide. You might want to take a picture with your phone, even though I know the slides are going to be sent out to all the participants. But you might want to take a picture of this slide with your phone because I put the publisher out there so you can find it. Land Forces Academy Review takes all kind of papers, mostly technology, but business, education, healthcare, management, all of those. It is out of a top university in Romania. They charge no APC charges. They publish four times a year and they are open access. They also have a sister journal called Scientific Bulletin that publishes twice a year. So when you send your paper to Land Forces, you can say either submit this to Land Forces or Scientific Bulletin, whichever publishes next. Management Teaching Review is a journal by SAGE. For those people that are on the call that are faculty members that are teaching at schools, they actually take teaching cases where you can take innovative assignments or simulations that you're doing in the classroom anywhere between, and all you have to write is like 1,200 to 2,000 words to explain it, the learning objectives, some ad theories behind it, and they'll publish it. And it's on the Australian Disney, Business Dean's Council list. But those of you all that are professors, we all do innovative things in our classroom for simulations to help people learn. You could do you know, probably some of you all have been teaching four or five years. You can take each one of your classes and create a paper off of this. There's another journal, Social Economic Challenges Journal. It's a hundred euro, but it's a great journal. It's open access and they'll take a wide variety of things from healthcare to business to cyber, cyber crime, et cetera. The other journal, Arab Golf Journal of Scientific Research, is also open access, there's no processing charge, but the challenge is this is, has a long kind of review process. Um, but again, it's a great journal, no charge. Next slide. Business Ethics and Leadership, there's a publishing there, there's 100 euros. Health Economics and Management Review is 100 euros. And then another one that doesn't charge anything is PSU Research Review. Emerald Publishing, open access, does not charge anything. It's an interdisciplinary journal. They'll take papers on all fields. So these are all list of journals that are fine, that are reputable, that are well indexed, that if you set a paper there, you know, you're gonna, they're gonna treat you right and do well by you if you have a good paper. Next slide. And then one of the things I wanna share with you, and you might wanna take a picture of this with your phone, is I'm also the editor on a peer review book with IGI Global Publishing. And each chapter will be indexed in Google Scholar and Scopus. So any student or any faculty member that wants to send a chapter, I'll get it peer reviewed and that book will come out in June. So. If you take a picture of this and you go to IGI Publishing and you type the title Leadership Action and Intervention in Health Business, Education and Technology, and you can find it, there's a call for papers there that if any of you all want to submit a paper to that, I'm more than apt to get it peer reviewed and give you good feedback. And that's a potential place where you can get it published. 
I get no kickback or anything beyond that, but I'm just a champion of helping people get their stuff out there. And so I agree to volunteer to edit with these books to allow my colleagues as well as my students an avenue that's reputable and fair and is not going to jerk them around to get a peer review paper published. Next slide. I talk about conference presentations. One, and we talked about that, the Midwest United States Association of Information Systems, for those who are in IT, is a great conference to publish at. They publish the proceedings. Papers don't have to be any longer than 2,500 words. Um, IEEE conferences, for those of you all in tech, are reputable. The proceedings are published. So if you Google IEEE, the papers are four to six pages, but they use a different format than APA. So a lot of times it's frustrating. They use brackets and they use numbers. So, you know, for me, I tend to stay away from that because I'm really familiar with APA. And sometimes it's a pain to take an APA paper and put it in an IEEE format. Academy of Management Conference is a good conference to present at. Next slide. So most serious issues to avoid, don't make up your data. Don't do plagiarism. You know, all of these journals have Turnitin um, where they're looking to see if it's plagiarized. Um, so you just need to be careful with that. Even I had a student one time that it came a plagiarism, but it was their own paper from an institute university. And they had to explain, hey, this is my paper. I was a student at that university. Because some universities will put your paper in a repository, which is unfortunate, which means sometimes it might come up. So you have to be careful of that. Next slide. So here's a review process. You submit the paper. It goes to the editor. If it's not formatted properly, the editor will send it back to you. So a lot of times, if you just email it directly to the editor, they'll want your name on the front. But if they have a submission system, you're supposed to submit a paper without your name on it. So it goes to the reviewers blinded so they don't know who you are. And their system will convert your paper from a Word document to a PDF where they can't check and see who the author of that paper is. The editor will sign reviewers the reviewers will review it. Depending on the journal, the review process can be anywhere from three to 12 weeks. If it comes back and it says revision, mate, and it'll come back, it'll say accepted as is, which is rare, accepted with minor revisions, and they'll tell you what it is, accepted with major revisions or rejected. And then in your turn is you'll do the revisions and you'll send it back. And some journals, the editor will just look at it, but some journals will send it back to the reviewer and it could be another three weeks. And then they'll send it to the proofreader at the journal and typecast it. And then they'll send you a final proof to review. And after a journal article is accepted, depending on the journal, it to go through the type set and proofreading, that could be another three months, which means your article could come out, you know, four to five months later. Next slide. I talk about that. And if you get revisions, there's no guarantee your paper will be accepted because sometimes you might not complete the revisions to their satisfaction. But I also tell people don't get mad when you get revisions or don't take it personal as part of the process. It's great to get revisions because at least your paper was not rejected. Next slide. Make sure when you get revisions, you review the comments and you respond a detailed email that responds to how you address the comments. Next slide. So you get a second round of reviews. That's a possibility. Next slide. So I mentioned the production process. You know, your manuscript is accepted, right? And, you know, it becomes published and then it becomes indexed. Next slide. So I talked about teaching faculty tenure track and research positions earlier, so next slide. 
So what's next for you? We're getting down to the end. And then I'll stay on again and answer questions for anyone. Number one, I want you to develop some career goals. Set some publishing and present presenting goals. Create a Google free Google Scholar profile if you haven't. Create a free ORCID profile. ORCID allows you to put a bio in all your education. A lot of journals connect with your ORCID, ORCID number. So any paper you publish or any paper you review, it will download and keep it in that repository. Create a free ResearchGate profile. ResearchGate is a place where you can put your articles up there and people can request copies of your articles and people around the globe in ResearchGate and academia.edu will reach out to you to say, I'd like to see your article, right? Um, I have some questions at the end I'm gonna ask. So the other thing I believe is subscribe to the Chronicle of Higher Education if you wanna be in higher ed. They have an online version, but one of the things I try to explain to people, higher education is different in industry. You wanna know the nuances, you wanna know what's going on. You wanna know about fellowships, grants, and trends. So I agree that if sometime you wanna teach or be in higher education, you must subscribe to the Chronicle of Higher Education. I also believe if you are a doctoral student or you complete a doctorate, you should sign up to be a peer reviewer at a journal to get experience because reviewing articles helps you with your own articles and writing. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. These are some examples of goals. Next slide. Next slide. We talked about that. So I'd like to answer questions. Dr. Burrell, let me jump in here for a moment and I'm gonna go ahead and finish uh, the few slides I have and then give permission uh, for people that do need to go to go ahead and exit. Uh, I wanna remind everyone I'm sending a copy of the, a link to the recording and a copy of the slides will be sent out in the next 24 hours. Let me go ahead and, and we'll come back to the questions. So meanwhile, go ahead and start typing your questions into the text chat. I see most of you have stayed and uh, he, uh, I know Dr. Burrell will stay on to answer the questions that we have. So bear with me as I just talk about a few uh, little commercial things at the end. Uh, upcoming webinars. The next webinar is on Thursday, March 21st with Dr. Joshua Sinai, uh, an a international expert on risk management and global security. And he's gonna be talking about that. Uh, then on April 18th, uh, one of our faculty members, Dr. Kolochenko, will be talking about uh, cyber law and cyber crime investigation. Dr. Kolochenko is both an attorney and a cybersecurity expert, so he'll bring that to bear there. Uh, for either of those and for all of our webinars, both uh, coming up and on demand, here's the um, URL, captechu.edu slash webinar hyphen series. I wanted to also mention um, that every month we host free uh, complimentary master's and doctoral virtual information sessions where we talk about the various degrees that we offer, uh, no obligation. It's a very helpful device for people considering an advanced degree. And if you're interested in that, you can send an email or the phone number and we'll get you connected up to one of those sessions. Finally, as I mentioned before, a copy of the slides and a link to the recording will be sent to all registrants. Just watch for that email. A certificate of completion is also available for 60 minutes for one hour of CEU, but you do need to request that. Wait until I send you the email with the link to the recording. It will have an opportunity for you to simply reply to that with the name that you want on the certificate. We'll prepare a certificate and send it to you. Now, with that, uh, we are technically done, and I'm going to go back to the Q&A so that um, we can um, uh, take it from there. And um, if you have questions, type it in. Let's see here. I'll uh, go ahead and read some of these in case uh, there are some of us that uh, are some of the participants that um, are not able to see the text yet. 
Diane asks, do you have a list of companies that are not recommended to publish with? And I think you just covered that and which, and which charge. So I think that that got covered along the line. Yeah. Um, so there's a Beals, B-E-A-L-L list of predatory journals that's out there that you can access on the internet. Dr. Burton asks a very intriguing question, and it is, uh, how do you get people to become comfortable with academic writing, which is a very different beast than normal writing that people do? Well, I always believe the first thing is you have to learn that master that meal process. That meal writing process, go to YouTube, and you have to practice that meal writing process to understand how to construct those paragraphs. And then from there, once you learn the meal writing process, just follow that whole step of if you state something that's factual or accurate in academic writing, you need to have a reference at the end of that sentence. When I did my first doctorate, my dissertation chair was a stickler for that, where it's it's almost optics, it looks scary, where you almost have to, it looks like you're over-referencing but, you know, the, these journals and in academic writing on a doctoral level, you have to use references. If you're writing paragraph with no references, it's just problematic. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Patricia says, uh, a lot to take in in my third semester, how to best follow up connecting on LinkedIn. And I think that would be correct that the best way to connect up with you would be on LinkedIn, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and, and on LinkedIn, and also on LinkedIn, if you go to my LinkedIn, how to contact me, my email's on there too. Oh, okay. Excellent. My Good. personal email's on there too. Um, Aslak Mover is uh, b based in Oslo, Norway, and he says, I'm located in Northern uh, Europe, how relevant are these journals for me? They're very relevant. These are global journals. They're well-respected. They're well-indexed. Some of them are on the Australian Business Dean's Council list, what a lot of organizations use at top business schools and schools of IT. They're not fly-by-night journals in any means. All right. Let me... I'm. Um, um... I know you are scrolling as well. I'm checking to see if I have caught any other questions. I don't see any others here uh, that, um, but I'm going to wait. Okay. Dr. Burton asks, uh, do you recommend that students get together as teams to publish? Yeah, I do. I think, you know, you publish some things on your own, but a lot of times you, if you publish as teams, you can do it a lot quicker and it's always good. The more sets of eyes on it, the better it is. So I always call it, it's a power of collective intelligence. So, you know, I don't have the monopoly on intelligence. So if I can add more people, right, it leads to more innovative ways of looking at things. So, I, but I do believe as a researcher, you want to have a couple things on your own. But I also believe you want to publish with other people because, you know, it's a way that you can get quantity and quality at the same time without you having to do all the heavy lifting by yourself. All right. I do not see any additional questions, so I'll make a one last call. If anyone has a question that they would like to type in, I do want to thank all of the people that have stayed on uh, this extra time. We normally do end right at the top of the hour, so we've gone on a little lo longer, and I appreciate your um, sticking with us. Um, and uh, I want to mention something that's in the side. I noticed when I was reviewing the registrations for today that we had many faculty who were coming from South University. I'd just like to welcome you. I'm not sure why so many from one institution have uh, uh, joined us, but it was just a pleasure to see all of those people come in. So if you're still on the call and you're from South University, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay, Margie Crow says she invited them. All right, uh, Dr. Dr. Burrell is your is your mentor. Okay, good. Well, that's a great testimonial too. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, uh, Patricia says we hear getting published to graduate to graduate is difficult over traditional presentation for for graduation. 
I'm not sure I follow that question, but uh, Dr. Burrell, perhaps you do. So it's difficult if you don't know the process, if you don't know the journals. So for me, when I finished my first doctorate, I did a traditional dissertation. My dissertation was 213 pages. Um, but when I did my second and third doctorates at Capital, I did an exergesis, which Capital has an approach where you can publish three peer review articles and write an exergesis. So you're essentially writing a chapter one and two in almost a chapter one and two in a traditional dissertation. And then your three, four and five are your three articles. So if you don't know articles or you don't know the right journals, yeah, it can be really difficult for you because if you send it to a journal and it gets rejected, you could keep sending it to journals and it can never get accepted. And that process could take you a year. But if you know decent journals that will review it and get it back to you quickly, and you can write good papers, for a lot of people, it's quicker. You know, I was fortunate that I transferred in a lot of credits. There are a lot of people at Capital that come in with transfer credits. So they're doing maybe a second doctorate where you only have like 12 months to finish. And I told people, if you're on that 12 month timeline, that first semester, you need to make sure your papers are at that journal. Right. And you almost have to start writing those papers. I have those papers ready that first week, because if the review process takes that first semester, then they get accepted. Right. You know, you 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 have to get close to your papers getting done before you defend. So, you know, if you're someone that transfers into 42 credits, which is the transfer program we have at Capital, where you could transfer in 42 credits and do three semesters and get a second doctorate. You know, 12 months is real quick and it can go by real fast. So it just all depends on you because I was publishing anyway and teaching at universities. It was a lot easier for me to publish the three papers than it was for me to try to sit down and crank out a dissertation. But even with the publishing piece with both of my doctorates, three were only required. I did six in one and five in another um, just because I really got involved in the research and really enjoyed what I was working on and really did some great things. Uh, I see the time is getting away with, uh, it's one seventeen. I'm gonna take this final question from Adam. Um, for a second doctorate at Capital, is a year a hard deadline to publish all three? And the answer would be no, it is not a hard deadline. It is not, but you have to come in there with a plan, you can't fool around. Yeah. It's doable yeah. with a strong plan of operation. Yeah, that would say. And again, we actually discussed some of this in our doctoral virtual information session. So if you are interested, by all means, sign up for that. Um, and we do have actually a number of people who've returned for a second doctorate. Um, it's amazing um, how they have leveraged their uh, massive expertise into a second or in some cases, even a third degree. So um, good. With that, I'm going to go ahead and um, return to this slide just simply to uh, let you know that uh, these uh, new webinars are coming up in March and April. We'll have uh, we'll talk more about the ones in uh, May and June later on. And I also want to mention again that uh, we will be happy to send you a certificate of participation and we'll be sending out a link to the slides and to the uh, recording to all of those who've registered today. Uh, it's been a tremendous pleasure uh, and an honor, Dr. Burrell, to have you join us. The amount of information you've shared in the little, last little over an hour has been absolutely amazing. And uh, I've learned so much. I'm not gonna be publishing, but <laughs> I've learned a lot. And now I understand a lot more about uh, the uh, the system that I did not know before. So thank you all. We are done and you may log off.